This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. Funded in part by... All it takes is a spark. One idea to take flight. The courage to seek the unknown. To innovate. Disrupt. To move us all forward. To explore a different perspective. At NASDAQ, we connect the world. It's ideas. It's capital. It's businesses. The people that drive global economies. The future isn't tomorrow. It's right now. All it takes is a spark. NASDAQ. Washington and Wall Street, from immigration and health care to tax reform, the role business can play to shape the Trump administration's agenda. Roll back roadblocks, why making changes to the wide-ranging law that governs Wall Street won't be easy, but it could be a windfall for investors. Tough road ahead is Toyota's biggest challenge, sitting in the White House. Those stories and more tonight on Nightly Business Report from Monday, February 6th. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Curb your enthusiasm. That's what Wall Street appears to have done, at least for today. The muted trading follows concerns that the White House's economic policy agenda may not get pushed through as quickly as hoped. The market's move higher since early November has been pegged to the idea that pro-growth policies like tax cuts and infrastructure spending would be high on the to-do list. But that is now in question. The Dow Jones Industrial Average fell 19 points to 20,052. The Nasdaq was off three, and the S&P 500 was down four. According to the Wall Street Journal, that index has not experienced a daily move of 1% or more for 35 consecutive sessions, the longest streak since 1974. House Speaker Paul Ryan recently said that tax reform won't be looked at until the spring after the budget passes. And in an interview yesterday, President Trump signaled that the timeline to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act is now likely to stretch into next year. But that extended timetable could complicate things for the health insurers, which have to commit soon to selling plans through the Affordable Care Act marketplaces. And they don't want to wait until they know, want to do that until they know what the future holds. Today, shares of Cigna, Aetna, Anthem, Humana, United Healthcare, all lower, in part because of that increased uncertainty. And Republicans are also taking aim at one of the more controversial parts of the health care system, Medicaid. The woman nominated to head the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid helped shape Indiana's Medicaid program. She was able to cross the aisle and work with both Republicans and Democrats. And as Bertha Coombs reports, many see her work as a potential blueprint for the GOP's reform plans. When crippling back pain forced Robin Henderson to leave her job last year, Medicaid was a godsend. If I didn't have the coverage, I would be in trouble. She was covered through the Healthy Indiana Plan, or HIP, the state's version of the ACA's Medicaid expansion. The architect behind HIP is Indiana consultant Seema Verma, brought in by then-Governor Mike Pence. She has since helped design Medicaid expansion plans in several states headed by Republican governors, like Iowa and Ohio, governors who did not support most other provisions of the Affordable Care Act. Now she's President Trump's pick to head the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. So she'll be deeply involved in the administration's plans to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act. Back home, Verma gets high marks for working across the aisle. Every time you encounter her, it is for what is our ability to solve the problem and how do we obtain that solution and she drives for that on a regular basis. She uh, was a very good listener and was able to put a lot of different perspectives kind of um, into the mix. But Verma has also come under fire by some policy experts for requiring low income HIP enrollees to contribute up to 2% of their income toward premiums and devising a plan that pushes them out if they fall behind. If you don't pay your premium on time or you don't uh, get your paperwork in on time, even if you go back and say, I'm going to pay my premium, you're actually locked out of the program for uh, 6 to 12 months. Republicans in Congress are looking to rein in federal funding for Medicaid, but in the states, even some Republican governors, like Indiana's Eric Holcomb, have cautioned that those cuts will have a big impact on their budgets. What happens to the Medicaid program writ large, for example, if spending is capped, 
uh, potentially could layer on top of an ACA repeal. That will simply be a huge cost shift to the states. Hospital and nursing home reimbursement could be hardest hit under Medicaid cuts in Seema Verma's hometown. Executives are hoping she can help build compromise in Washington to limit the pain. There's been a lot of discussions about how bipartisan this needs to be. We are optimistic about what that means. Heap and Rollies like Robin Henderson are hoping they won't lose their lifeline. It's important to have health insurance. It's hard not to have it. Bertha Coombs, Nightly Business Report. Well, the biggest technology companies in the world are fighting the president's uh, immigration order, a major issue for business. Nearly 100 companies, including Apple, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Netflix, Twitter, filed a motion with the court last night that says the executive order represents, quote, a significant departure from the principles of fairness and predictability that have governed the immigration system of the U.S. for more than 50 years. The order also, they say, makes it more difficult for U.S. companies to hire talent. IBM, Qualcomm, Oracle, uh, among the big companies in technology that were not part of that legal brief. Despite some tensions between President Trump and the business world, there is one school of thought that contends corporate executives have the best chance of helping the White House shape policy. And that theory comes from Tom Friedman of The New York Times. Right now, the Republican Party is, is obviously um, uh, not going to be uh, being much of a check on him. Uh, the Democrats really have no ability to do so. The mainstream media um, uh, doesn't have a vote. So it's really the business community that has the access uh, to the president and the standing with him, I think, uh, to engage him. Well, let's turn now to Michael Farr to talk more about how business executives could help shape policy in Washington. He's president of the money management firm Farr, Miller and Washington. He would be the Farr in that uh, equation of Farr, Miller and Washington. <laughs> Michael, good to see you. Um, let's talk first about the pace of the uh, Trump agenda. You pointed out it's something I happen to have also been uh, talking about. But the idea that things are going to move fast and without hiccups and hairballs in Washington is a little naive. I, I think so, Tyler, and thank you again for having me. And great job on n nailing the Dow 20,000. I mean, within a couple of weeks. How many other people get to do that? You nailed it. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that, yeah, people get too optimistic about Washington. And the way Sue started the program tonight about sort of Wall Street saying, curb your enthusiasm. Oh, Washington is still Washington seems to be the realization. Uh, so it is. And I think given Trump's very full agenda, and I mean, it has been at a blazing speed. It's been difficult to keep up. And now we're still watching, okay, we're watching uh, the Affordable Care Act kind of bog down. We hear that the tax cuts might be sometime <clears throat> probably towards the end of the year, take effect next year. And infrastructure spending isn't garnering a lot of enthusiasm anywhere in Washington because, you know, a lot of the right wing Republicans certainly want to be uh, very fiscally constrained. So the, lots getting right. bogged down. It, it's not all bad. It's just Washington. What about the, the thought, the school of thought right now, Michael, that perhaps industry leaders, CEOs, which Mr. Trump repeatedly has called to the White House, may be better suited to shape policy in a more apolitical way than those who are on Capitol Hill. Do you believe that that is the case? And what is the appetite for many CEOs to take on a president? I think this is the most fascinating new administration to watch, Sue, and it's a terrific question because we're watching different CEOs take different approaches. We have the tech guys who are sort of protesting, particularly on the immigration issues now and their ability to hire. We're watching others sort of get, seem to try and get along well with the president. So do you do it by sucking up and getting along and going along, or do you oppose and fight this new president? And what's going to be more effective for your company? I think if I were uh, at the, a Fortune 100 company, I would, have a, I would be having my research folks study exactly the relationship with Putin. I don't know exactly the dynamics of that relationship, but it seems very successful for Mr. Putin, uh, and it seems like that might be at least a model for those who are trying to figure out how to advance their company's mm -hmm. cause the farthest with the new administration. Do you think companies are worried that they're going to be the uh, object of a Twitter uh, tantrum on the president's part? 
I, I think everybody's a little bit worried about that, Tyler. I mean, in particular, uh, I think that Janet Yellen should probably be worried about that, because the president's agenda is for fiscal stimulus, mm -hmm. tax cuts, and things that are going to propel the economy. Well, those things can be inflationary. What happens if the Federal Reserve starts raising rates, trying to countermand some of that inflation? What's the president going to tweet in the middle of Mrs. Yellen's uh, next press conference? I mean, it, it, the unpredictability uh, it, we're right. getting used to, but Wall Street doesn't like it. Michael, thanks as always. Michael Farr with Farr, Miller and Washington of Washington, D.C. Thank you. You bet. Still ahead, how a rollback in banking regulations could put more money in investors' pockets. President of the European Central Bank struck back at the Trump White House. Mario Draghi rejected accusations that Germany manipulates the euro and used a congressional report to back up his statement. In its latest report to Congress released on October 14, 2016, the U.S. Treasury itself stressed that Germany does not manipulate its currency. The reason is that Germany does not satisfy all three criteria used by the U.S. Treasury to identify unfair currency practices. Last week, Peter Navarro, the president's top trade advisor, said that Germany is using a grossly undervalued currency to take advantage of the U.S. Mr. Draghi also warned that deregulating the banking industry was potentially dangerous and could start the next financial crisis. As we reported Friday, President Trump signed a directive asking federal agencies to review the sweeping group of Wall Street reforms embedded in the law known as Dodd-Frank. But as Steve Leisman reports, big rollbacks could meet some big roadblocks. In signing an executive order last week, the president said he plans to, quote, cut a lot out of the regulatory reform law known as Dodd-Frank. The reality is that changing the law will require a lot more than just his signature on an executive order. First, there's Congress. Jeb Henterling heads the Financial Services Committee and is a strong supporter of overhauling Dodd-Frank. But he'll have to find common ground with the more moderate Senator Mike Crapo, head of Senate Banking. Overall, the Senate could prove the biggest hurdle. During the period when the Republicans were in power in Congress uh, before this, they never moved for the total repeal of it the way they did with health care. And you're going to need 60 votes to change any of the major legislative pieces. And there are multiple agencies involved. They include the Federal Reserve and Office of the Controller of the Currency, both of which regulate banks. But there are many more. And the issues are complex. Should big banks keep more capital on hand than smaller banks? What's the best way to wind down a bank if it gets into trouble and make sure it doesn't require a taxpayer bailout? Not every change requires changing the law. The president, for example, can appoint people who can enforce it less stringently. But for at least the next year, President Trump will have to deal with Fed Chair Janet Yellen, who is not opposed to all Dodd-Frank reforms, but has generally supported them. And then there's the question of what exact problem President Trump is trying to fix. We have so many people, friends of mine, that have nice businesses. They can't borrow money. They just can't get any money because the banks uh, just won't let them borrow because of the rules and regulations. But the data show banks are lending pretty strongly right now. And a key small business survey shows that few business owners have trouble getting credit. While many disagree over the need for fixing Dodd-Frank or how to do it, there's fairly good agreement that it's one of the most complex laws of the land. And fixing it won't be easy. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Steve Leisman. If President Trump is successful in repealing Dodd-Frank, investors, according to the Wall Street Journal, could potentially see a return of more than $100 billion in capital in the form of share buybacks and dividends from some of the biggest banks in the country. Marty Mosby, director of Bank and Equity Strategies at Vining Sparks, joins us now to talk more about that. Welcome, Marty. It's nice to have you here. Well, thanks for having me this afternoon. Let's start with, with why the banks would want to do this, because we've kind of outlined the way they might do it. What would compel them to do this? Well, what the banks are looking to be able to do is to get back to being able to manage their companies uh, like you know, all other industries for the most part, where you can look at your capital, you can look at your balance sheet, 
uh, and not be looking over your shoulder at the regulators to make sure that you're not having to flinch. Uh, as we're being able to kind of move forward, we've built a lot of capital. We've uh, sustained a, a historical amount of liquidity, and the banks are looking to now kind of move forward and begin to take some of the reins back from the regulators at this point. You know, Marty, are, are the banks really in a firm enough position to start paying out some of that extra capital that they've had to store? Is there, are their leverage positions uh, now healthy enough that they can do it? Because it was really leverage that, as so often is the case, killed them. Well, when we look at leverage, you got to make sure you look at the two different pieces of leverage. One is uh, capital, uh, and they've built capital. And the $100 billion that you're talking about is over the worst case scenario that the Fed can come up with in stress testing the capital positions. But let's put that aside for a second. What really matters is liquidity. And you've seen two and a half trillion dollars of increased liquidity come into the system as we've had really strong deposit growth over the last eight to nine years. So the banks are in a position to start looking to move forward and get past the you know, anxiety that you know, framed the financial crisis we just went through. All right, now if, if indeed there is the appetite to roll back some or part of, of the Dodd-Frank resolution, there's still the Federal Reserve, there are still the, the stress tests and things like that. How would that fit into the overall equation? Well, this um, could really be very simple. Uh, we don't have to repeal the whole thing. We need to change two numbers. Uh, and that will address the majority of where the problem is. Uh, the unintended consequences of Dodd-Frank has overly burdened community and regional banks. Mm -hmm. They wrote the law so that the thresholds were at $10 billion and at $50 billion, which are banks that all the things that you mentioned, you know, what do you do when they fail? It's not a problem. Uh, what we need to do is to take the $10 billion and move it up to $50 billion. Take the $50 billion threshold, move it up to $250 billion. Changing those two things, I think, can get bipartisan support and okay. can really be pushed through fairly easily. On that note, Marty, thank you very much. Marty Mosby with, thank with you. Vining Sparks. Well, Hasbro toys with Wall Street targets, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. The company said strong demand for dolls based off of Disney's movie Frozen, as well as its Easy Bake Oven products, helped it easily top estimates. Hasbro also hiked its quarterly dividend 12% to 57 cents a share. And look what shares did today, up 14% to $94.31. The luxury jeweler Tiffany said its chief executive has stepped down from his role following the board's disappointment with recent financial performance. Tiffany said that while it searches for a replacement, the company's chairman will take over as the interim CEO. Tiffany off 2% at 78.49. The consumer products company Newell Brands said strength in several of its businesses caused sales to more than double, but the results still missed Wall Street expectations. The owner of Yankee Candle and Elmer's Glue Brands posted earnings that were in line with estimates and said it would raise its guidance for the year. Shares, though, down more than 5% at 44.23. And the meat producer Tyson Foods said stronger demand for beef and pork led to record earnings, which topped expectations. The company also posted better than expected sales, gave upbeat guidance for the year. Tyson also said it recently received a subpoena from U.S. officials uh, it believes is related to allegations the company engaged in price fixing. And that sent shares down 3% to 63.13. The food distributor Cisco said higher margins coupled with steady volume growth led to better than expected profits in its latest quarter. The company's sales rose, but the results were not quite good enough to beat estimates. Shares finished down more than 2% to 51.20. Aratana Therapeutics, which develops pet medications, said in a regulatory filing that the Center for Veterinary Medicine has requested additional information regarding that company's appetite stimulation drug. Aratana says it now expects that treatment to be delayed until the end of this year. The shares plunged 18 percent to $6.59. Pharmacy benefits manager Espress Scripps said prescription drug spending for its patients fell in 2016 to just under 4 percent. That's a more than 25 percent de decrease from the year before. Express Scripps negotiates drug prices for the health insurers and employers. Shares rose just a fraction to 67.40.
And Walt Disney CEO Bob Iger reportedly may be considering staying on longer at the entertainment giant as there is still no successor in place. Iger is currently slated to retire in June of 2018. Disney shares fell fractionally to 109.57. The Dow Component reports its earnings tomorrow. Toyota says its profits could grow almost 10 percent this year. The company raised its full year earnings outlook after reporting disappointing quarterly results. Phil LeBeau has more on the automaker's outlook and why it could get more attention of President Trump. Toyota is in a tough spot. Earnings for the last quarter of 2016 fell 23 percent as the company sold fewer vehicles. But this year, profits are expected to grow almost 10 percent due largely to the weak Japanese yen, which helps the profitability of vehicles built in Japan and exported to markets like the U.S. The weak yen is also a longtime complaint of the CEOs of the big three. They believe the yen allows Toyota to be more aggressive with rebates and incentives, and they say it ultimately cuts into sales and profitability for GM, Ford and Chrysler. It's a complaint Toyota calls false. But the bigger issue for the Japanese automaker could be President Trump. He has blasted Toyota on Twitter for building a plant in Mexico that will export cars to the U.S. So far, Toyota has said it is not changing those plans. About half of the vehicles it sells in the U.S. are built in the U.S. In addition, the company is expanding capacity at a plant in Indiana. The level of U.S. production by Japanese automakers and the weakness of the Japanese yen could be two topics discussed later this week by Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and President Donald Trump. They're scheduled to meet on Friday at the White House. Phil LeBeau, Nightly Business Report, Chicago. Coming up, Elon Musk isn't the only big thinker in his family. What brother Kimball is doing to change the way the world eats. Call it a food revolution. When you think of farming, you probably imagine farms stretching out in the Midwest. But what about in a parking lot in Brooklyn? Well, a new startup is working to bring fresh produce to city residents. Andrea Day got the first look at these new urban farms. We are literally on a parking lot in the middle of Brooklyn. In the shadow of a New York housing project is the brainchild of Tobias Peggs and his partner, Kimball Musk. Well, this is a farm. Urban farming, but instead of rooftops, the food is grown inside shipping containers. Inside each shipping container is the equivalent of a two acre outdoor field. His business is Square Roots Grow, according to Pegs, designed to help entrepreneurs capitalize on what he predicts will be a real food revolution. People have lost trust in the industrial food system and those people will want real food. And Kimball and I think that that opportunity that presents itself today is bigger than the internet was when we both started our careers 20 years ago. The food is grown vertically on these white towers that contain the crops without soil. He's probably growing 18 head of lettuce on every single tower. And there are 256 towers in his farm. The environment inside is totally controlled, from the length of daylight to nutrients, which are mixed in with the water that feeds the roots. We don't use pesticides. We don't spray. And the entire system, he says, is engineered to use the fewest resources possible, like these pink LEDs with just the right spectrum of light for growth. Uh, right now I'm growing watercress. Uh, I have a brassica salad mix of kale. He's a former banker turned urban farmer. Uh, I think the highlight for my week is to do my harvest, to package it up, and then to bring it to people. And Square Roots works directly with farmers to help make that happen, coaching them how to grow and sell, and then takes a percentage of the revenue. The kale that I'll be selling is three hours since it's been cut. I have no idea how old the kale that I usually buy is. This is a global megatrend. 
And just how big does he think this mega trend will ultimately be? Well, he's planning to build urban farms in at least 20 cities by 2020. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Andrea Day. 111 million people watched the New England Patriots make Super Bowl history last night, but the team's come from behind win may not bode well for investors. Uh, that's according to the Super Bowl indicator. Maybe you've heard of it. This unscientific forecasting tool says that stocks will fall if a team from the original American Football League wins the game. And this year, that team was the Patriots. The indicator has been correct 40 out of 50 years. That is an 80% success rate. But you knew that. Oh, mm, dear. All right. Hang on to your jerseys because finally tonight, the jersey that Patriots quarterback Tom Brady was wearing in last night's game is reportedly still missing. And that jersey could be worth a lot. According to Bloomberg, one sports collectibles seller said the Super Bowl MVP's jersey could be worth upwards of $500,000. Wow. That does it for us tonight on Nightly Business Report. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. And thanks for me as well. I'm Tyler Matheson. Have a great evening. We'll see you tomorrow. Nightly Business Report has been funded in part by... All it takes is a spark. One idea to take flight. The courage to seek the unknown. To innovate. Disrupt. To move us all forward. To explore a different perspective. At NASDAQ, we connect the world, its ideas, its capital, its businesses, the people that drive global economies. The future isn't tomorrow, it's right now. All it takes is a spark. NASDAQ.